So we're talking about section 6.2 now, which is called probability models. And I want to just begin with a few definitions. Uh, the first definition is the definition of something, the word random. Okay, what do we actually mean by the word random? It's going to be important we get some of these ideas down right away. What we mean by random is we cannot predict any individual trial or event, but the distribution is predictable in the long run, meaning after many, many trials. For example, why do we say that a coin flip is random? Well, any one particular coin flip, we don't know whether it's going to come up heads and tails, but in the long run, we know that about half will be heads and about half will be tails. Kind of same thing works for dice, right? You can't predict any one individual roll of the dice, but in the long run, if you roll many, many, many dice, you would expect about a sixth of them to come up any one particular number. A sixth of them will be four, for example. Probability, therefore, another definition, is the proportion of times any event will occur in the long run. Okay, So we might write, for example, the probability of heads is 0 0.5. And this big P stands for probability. Okay? It may be, for example, that a certain baseball player, the probability of getting a hit is like point, I don't know, three, one, or something like that. Okay? In general, usually we call any event, which is what's inside the parentheses here, um, by capital letters. So we may say the probability of A is 0 0.1. means that there's a 10% chance or probability that event A will happen. Okay? Um, so this big capital P means probability, and then what's in parentheses is the event, and then this is the pr probability of that happening. And again, you think probability, don't think one trial, think in the long run, after many trials. Okay, next term is the term sample space, which is just a set of all possible outcomes. So, for example, when you flip a coin, what is the sample space? Well, it's heads and tails. Right, when you roll a die, what is the sample space? It's one, two, three, four, five, six. If you pick a student and say, well, uh, what grade are they in? Okay, you can say, what's the probability they are a freshman? What's the probability they are a senior? But the sample space, that's a worst cable curly brace, is 9, 10, 11, 12. Now, all of those have a certain fixed number of uh, elements of the sample space. They're all, uh, fi no, they're all discrete. But you could say, for example, when I pick a student, how, what's their weight? for example. In that case, you might say, well, the sample space is really like any number between, I don't know, let's say 80 uh, to, I don't know, you know well, the biggest student school maybe is 250. And there's basically and every possible weight in between. So that's the idea of sample space. Okay, our next term is something called the complement. And the complement we define is basically the logical opposite, and you can think about it as not the event happening. So we talked about events before. I maybe wrote, what's the probability of getting a hit? Well, if you didn't want to talk about that, you could also talk about what's the probability of not getting a hit. And that would be hit, and the little c kind of written as an exponent would be uh, pronounced hit complement, the probability, probability you do not get a hit. For example, if I wrote it like this, the probability when you roll a die that you get three complement well, that's the probability that you do not roll a 3. And that would be, for example, probably 5, 6, because 5 of the 6 outcomes on the die are not a 3. And the next term is a little bit confusing because there's two synonyms. We talk about the word disjoint or the phrase mutually exclusive, and they mean exactly the same thing. And it means two events that cannot occur at the same time. Um, so, for example, think about this. If A is the event of heads and B is the event tails, those events are disjoint because there's no way you can have both event A and event V. You can't get both heads and tails on a die. Now think about the event X is being a senior and Y is taking Spanish. Are those events disjoint or mutually exclusive? Well, the answer is no, because they can happen at the same time. A student can be a senior and be taking Spanish. Okay? So if they can occur at the same time, then they are not disjoint or not mutually exclusive. 
If there's no possible way they can ever happen at the same time, then they are disjoint. Okay? And we'll look at several examples of that as they kind of go along. This next term deserves its own slide because it's super duper important, and it's the term independent. And the term independent we're going to talk an awful lot about over the next, uh, even this chapter and other ones, but it means one outcome or event does not influence the other. So for, and the way I think about it is, if you knew that event A happened, would that change your, your guess as the probability for event, for event B? For example, let's look at the events A is someone is blonde, and B is someone is taking Latin. Are those events independent? Well, the answer is yes. Because if you knew that event A had happened, someone was blonde, would that change your change the probability that they take Latin? In other words, do blonde pe people take Latin at the same rate the rest of the population is? I like to kind of phrase this question as, okay, there's someone outside, what's the probability they take Latin? You would give me some number, and then I would say, now I'm telling you they're blonde. Do you want to change your answer? If you don't change your answer, then what you're saying is that one does not influence or affect the other, so then they are independent. So blonde and taking Latin are um, independent of each other. Okay. Now let's look at another example. Kind of relate. Really stick with school. Let's have X be someone is a senior, and Y is someone is taking calculus. Are those events independent? And the answer here is no, because, okay, if I told you someone was a senior, does that change uh, the probability that they're taking calculus? In other words, look at my, someone standing out in the hallway example. Someone standing out in the hallway, what's the probability they take calculus? You would give me some number, and then I would say, okay, now I'm going to tell you that person is a senior. Do you want to change your answer? And of course you would, because seniors take calculus at a higher rate than the rest of the student body. So therefore, taking calculus and being a senior are not independent. In other words, they kind of influence or affect each other. The biggest use of independence, think about like coin flips. Okay, Every individual coin flip is independent of each other because if you flip a coin that comes up heads, what's the probability the next coin comes up heads? Well, it's still 50%. Coins don't have any memory or anything else like that. So coin flips are independent, as are a lot of things. Rolling dice are independent, things like that. Okay, this will kind of come up a lot when you think about like is a, if a base if someone's shooting free throws, are individual shots independent? We we'll probably will assume they are, but in the real world, we'll say they are not because actually, kind of you know, people get hot, people get tired, the stress of the situation, people can kind of you know get a little practice with shots. So that's the idea of independence. Um, let's move on. What we're going to talk a lot about in this section is ways to solve various probability problems. And I'm going to kind of say that there are five ways, and I just want to get, run through this list for you right now. Obviously, a big topic later on will be how do you pick which of these five ways we're going to use. The first way is simulation, which actually we talked a little about in the previous section, 6.1. We're going to spend the bulk of time today talking about Venn diagrams and tree diagrams, and then later on in the future lecture, we'll talk about uh, enumeration and rules of probability is basically 6.3. Okay. But we're going to begin talking about uh, Venn diagrams and tree diagrams, and I'm going to give you just a couple examples of each one. Okay, so here's a kind of a Venn diagram example. I'll let you read the example. At a college, well, that was weird. At a college, 70% of students take an any English course, 80% of students take any science course, and 55% of students take both an English course and a science course. So what we want to do is we want to draw a Venn diagram. Okay, and so here's what a Venn diagram looks like. It looks something like this. You draw a big rectangle, and then you draw two overlapping circles, kind of like the MasterCard logo. Let's label this one English, and this one Science. And I'm going to do it all in terms of percent. We know that where they overlap, well, that's in the middle. That's 55%. But we know that the entire English bubble has to be 70%. We already have 55 in the middle, so this has to be 15%. That, so you notice 15 plus 55 is going to add us up to 70%. Then the entire science bubble has to add up to uh, 80%, so this has to be 25% right there. And now if you do the math, 15% plus 55% plus 
plus 25 percent adds up to 95 percent. The whole rectangle has to add up to 100 percent, so there has to be 5 percent out here. Okay, that's a 5. So that's an example of a Venn diagram. So just a quick question here. Uh, are taking an English class... Oh, where's my pointer? Oh, where's my pointer? Come on, pointer. Are taking an English class and taking a science class disjoint or mutually exclusive? Well, if you think about that uh, Venn diagram I drew for you, okay, does that mean do they happen at the same time? In other words, is there any area right in here? This is the place where people are both taking an English class and taking a science class. Well, this area, you may remember, was 55%. So therefore, is it possible to take an English class and take a science class? Well, heck yeah, because 55% of people are doing that. So to answer to the question, are uh, taking an English class and taking a science class disjoint? The answer is no, okay? because 55% of people are doing both. Is it possible to do both? Certainly, 55% of people are.